Okay, folks, I think that we're going to go start. Sorry if I missed that. According to my watch, it is correct. So, uh, everyone sees the screen now, you know? Yeah. Okay. Well, first, before I start, uh, this is Zeki Demirbleck. And sitting next to me is Jiwa Lin. And both of us basically will be uh, presenting these webinars. And uh, the intent is basically go and show you the latest status of these two tools, WaveNet and PyNet. We started these tools uh, approximately in 2012 as a collaborative effort, you know, as a uh, field-driven need with the coastal district. So in a way, basically, we hope that, you know, this is, you know, can be considered as a joint product, you know. And there are several coastal districts that work help us, you know, basically bring in this to this current level. So WaveNet and PyNet address uh, a broad need of the uh, core coastal community. And the intent is basically to provide district map ocean data. By map ocean, I'm referring to meteorological and oceanographic data that are essential to the coastal district project. And included in this, obviously, are winds, waves, water levels, currents, tides, river discharge, and so on. And uh, most coastal projects basically call for some, if not, you know, basically many of these innovative you know, data to be used. So in 2012, we started with a uh, proof of concept type of development, and and as a basically uh, with that approach, the tools evolved and the content of the tools have changed. Uh, since then, we have published some technical notes, basically, which are user guides, and I'll, you know, show you, you know, basically where they are, and you can take a look at those. But understand that basically because the tool has evolved, you know, some of the things in those, you know, basic technical notes are no longer basically available in this latest version. However, the data part of the data sources that basically information for those are still valid and applicable. So I, I recommend that basically you, you know, download those and take a look at those, you know, they're still going to be very, very useful to you. Again, the goal of this webinar is to show you what we have basically as of, you know, today and, and get some feedback from you. For additional features and capabilities that, that are you know, you recommend to be included in future versions of these two toolboxes. Uh, I ask that you provide basically your recommendation to uh, Julie Rosati, our program manager for Coastal Inlet Research Program, CERP, and you can CC to me as well so that, you know, basically we get, you know, your uh, comments, suggestions, you know, basically needs, and then uh, management will basically go through the uh, requested, you know, basically additions and will decide what's the best way to handle those probably. It may be that, you know, Julie may come back and ask you to submit, you know, statement of needs specific, you know, and that kind of thing. So, but uh, we welcome any suggestion basically and improvement capability that really you think that, you know, needs to be here and is not here. And we realize that basically not everything is here and a lot of things that can be added. We have some new features that are going to come in the next developmental version of it, and uh, which I will discuss briefly, you know. But uh, there are things that, you know, basically you guys, you know, basically would like to have, you know, to be added. We will welcome, you know, basically any suggestions, ideas. Uh, these web tools, basically, based tools are designed to support, at this, at this stage, a few 
you know, use it, up to maybe 10 or so, you know, simultaneously. We really have not tested the server's, you know, capability to handle hundreds or thousands of users, you know, simultaneously. Simultaneously, I emphasize that. I think that there can be, you know, basically 100, you know, users, but as long as they are not, you know, uh, grabbing the same data as this or whatever, it should stay okay. But we believe that at least based on what we hear from the experts, simultaneous users, you know, by hundreds or thousands would require more CPU, more storage, more bandwidth, and and even different type of basic security software, you know, by ACES and so on. So because of that, while am I I'm going to the uh, webinar. I ask that you do not, you know, click basically, you know, the links, you know, to the uh, to the toolboxes. But I would like very much, you know, basically, once I'm done, for you to go and basically just, you know, access it and do repeat, you know, what you saw basically uh, during the webinars. Again, we would like to get as much feedback from you as possible. Now. In the initiation of this, we have to make a decision basically what is the strategy in terms of really formulating and building of these toolboxes. In terms of access, we decided that basically uh, we're going to get access one data source at a time and one point, one geographic location at a time, okay, to begin with. At least get the mechanics the, uh, you know, basically building blocks and the uh, computational engines and everything, you know, work on a point database type of thing. And then we can think about basically generalizing that into, you know, gridded data, multidimensional you know, data and that kind of thing. So this first release, official release of that, you know, is based on the one data source and one geographic location at a time. We decided basically to use Python scripting in terms of basically managing the uh, user requests and controls to manage the data. And we augmented that, you know, with uh, leverage that, you know, with our existing code, Fortran, MATLAB, and so on that we have developed basically over the years. So the point that I want to make there's no license software is used here, okay? Everything is open source. What we grab basically from the you know web is what's available publicly, either from Google and Earth, you know, or Esri or whatever. You know, no, we we don't deal with any license you know software whatsoever. Now, we also understand that and, and realize that you know there are probably different ways you know, to go about getting the data, processing the data, and analyzing the data. There are different methods and probably if you take five people and, and you may see five different approaches. So our approach is just one of those, you know, and we don't claim that it's the best or right or whatever, but you will see basically and and that's why we wanna hear from you guys, you know, in terms of is it clear does it do the what you need to do and, and so on. The other thing that we decided to do, uh, we want to access only existing sources which are publicly available. And this is very important. There are data sources out there, proprietary and, and so on. We did not want to basically touch any of those things because that raises all sorts of legal issues and other things, you know, in terms of the dissemination of this through the core as well as through the government and other users. So we're accessing only data sources that are publicly available. What do we mean by data? In our basically conceptual model, data includes the field measurements and predictions. Okay? So it could be a gauge, we basically type of, you know, uh, you know source, uh, or it could be some kind of calculated, you know, coming from a uh, numerical model. So that's what we mean by data. The way that we basically formulated this, we said, okay, uh, user is going to come and define a point of interest and specify a time of interest uh, for which, you know, the data are needed. 
and then uh, WaveNet and PyNet, basically these tools need, are going to fetch the data, help process the data, and in doing so, we locally cache basically the data. Some data, we save it, you know, for uh, a good reason that I will explain, for instance. And some data, user basically may basically uh, want to, you know, save it at their own and so on. Uh, the data that basically we save certain data, that data is, is older than one month. It's discarded and and when the new other user comes and goes to the same source, basically we go retrieve it. And the reason for that is basically there are updates to the data. So we don't want to have anything that, you know, uh, to be locally cached, you know, available if it's older than, you know, basically one month. Um, again, uh, this version of the basically WaveNet and PyNet are going to be focusing on the uh, point data, one ge geographic location, and the grid data will be considered in the next basically phase, next version of the uh, these toolboxes. In the next phase, we will also uh, consider, for instance, to the spectra, grid data of the waves and currents that come here basically from numerical models and so on. So this kind of basic outline, in short, what the approach was, the thinking, you know, uh, you know, basically setting up and formulating, you know, this uh, system. Any questions? Okay. So what I like to do, uh, you see it on the screen, and I click that link basically that I. Uh, to send out, you know, with the announcement, and right now in WaveNet, and that's the screen that basically you will see, okay? For the WaveNet, uh, you can see on the right-hand side to the right up corner right here, uh, you will see six data sources are listed there, right? So they are the NDDC, that's the National Data Buoy Center, you know? Data. Next one is the WIS Wave Information Study. Next one is the CIDEP Coastal Data Information Program. Next one is GWAS Great Lakes Observing System. Following that is the GLCFS Great Lakes Coastal Forecasting System, and the last data source is Wave Watch 3 from NOAA. So these are the six data sources that basically are selected being used in WaveNet, you know, at this time. Uh, in terms of the layout of the system, at the top you will see the name. This will be either WaveNet or PyNet. I just added this the other day, you know, here. If you click this PyNet button right here, it automatically should switch into PyNet so that you don't have to go and type, you know, the link again and so on. So I'm going to revert back you know, to WaveNet. And uh, so at the top next to WaveNet, there are basically four menu items. And in the above, it talks about basically the purpose of WaveNet and describes you know, what WaveNet is. So basically, this is the first module of this you know, MetOcean data system. It's a, it's a GUI, web-based GUI, that allows users to access, process, analyze wave and wind data. And, and, and then describe, you know, basically, you know, which data sources are used and so on. It provides and produces, basically, products that we receive feedback, you know, from the district in terms of tabular data, graphical data, and so on. Next menu item is point of contact. You can contact Liwa or me or Julie at any time if there are any questions, you know, basically about, you know, the server or, uh, or the uh, system itself, the data itself. On the more information section, this is where, you know, basically you will find all of the previously published publications about WaveNet, related to WaveNet. 
there's a link also to this article from the Coastal Inlet Research Forum, sir. So if you click that, you know, you will be going there. And any of these other, uh, basically, documents listed here, the first one about the NDDC implementation in WaveNet. So if you click that, now it, this particular browser was able to open this. I need to make a comment about uh, web-based basically tools. Web-based tools in many ways, ways are dependent on the browser that you will be using. So even though basically we're using internationally, you know, accepted approved basic API languages, you know, uh, that are common, shared, but the way that are implemented and used, you know, by each browser, each developers are different. So Bill Gates, you know, basically has his own way, you know, uh, his functioning, you know, IE, uh, Firefox basically, uh, Mozilla, you know, basically may work different, and Chrome may work, you know, basically different. If you try opening this maybe in one of those browsers, you know, may not open like this automatically. But in this one it did, okay? So, uh, the second one is basically talked about implementation of it, you know, in, uh, in, of, for with wave information data. And, and if you come here, turn on all of the features, basically, then you can save the document and so on. Okay? So all documents are there. If you have difficulty opening in the browser that, you know, ACID installed on your machine and it doesn't open, just right on click and say save link as. And then you will get the PDF file and then you can open that, you know, on your machine basically. Save it in a local directory. And that's another way basically getting this. Uh, I'm going to go to the, probably the uh, last one. Some of this are the website. And, you know, or documents that basically we downloaded, you know, from there, described, you know, their, you know, system, Waywatch 3. So you may want to go to NOAA's, you know, website, you know, basically, if you need additional information about Waywatch 3 and so on. But the main manual, what I'm saying, you know, basically is available to you right here. It's fine. It's a big manual, I guess. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, oh, the other thing that is when you're using WaveNet, understand after you specify a station and a time, start time, end time, then you click basically will be clicking to the download retrieve the data. Obviously we're handshaking, you know, with the uh, you know provider of the data. So we go to NOAA you know, basic server. We go to with you know basic data server and, and, and so on, GLOS and TDIP and so on. Now it's possible that you know basically the source that we're going to is down. In fact, like this weekend, you know, when I was trying to access the Provo database from France, and you know the server will not respond. But when I basically send email to my contact, they say, "Thank you, we're doing the maintenance in the weekend, Saturday, but it should be back, you know, Sunday or whatever." So sometimes understand that you know the server, you know, basically maybe uh, maybe down. Okay. And in this case, you know, basically I couldn't open it and. So, but if I right mouse and save link as, I can save it and look at it in a basic you know, local machine. So these are the sources, basic previously published publications about WaveNet that uh, uh, we provide you here as a link so that you can go and access them. And and the last button basically is for you to switch between WaveNet and PyNet, you know, on the fly, you know, rather than typing IP address and so on. Okay. So I'm going to close that. 
And uh, now I'm going to go through basically and show you a example application that is starting with the NDVC and see basically uh, how it works. When you click for any of these data sources, basically some icons, you know, come on and show the, you know, local geographic stations that basically we decided not to display. There are more buoys or whatever. For display purposes and not cluttering things, we decided we're going to, you know, basically put, you know, no, no more than basically about 50, you know, basically, you know, sources. But if you, if you double click and or zoom into an area, you will see more maybe, you know, basically stations there. So it will populate, you know, based on the, you know, zoomed area. Okay? So anytime, if you would like to basically uh, reset the map and you will come back, you know, basically to original, you know, display. And you can go back again, you know, click, you know, your data and, and then basically zoom and get, you know, basically you know, zoom into any area that you like. You can move, obviously, you know, the um, mapping features, you know, just like, you know, any other, you know, uh, you know, GIS, GUI, you know, basically, web type of thing. And I'm going to select, basically, a buoy in the East Coast as a demo right here, 41002. As soon as you select, basically, a source selection, you know, here, you have two options. The first one is basically for readiness to access, you know, this NDBC 41002 data. The bottom one is the station, you know, link. So if you like to go, you know, query and see, find out a little bit more about, you know, the station itself, you know, you can do that. And again, on the fly, you know, come here, look at it, and you can go to historical data, real-time data, let me go to real-time data, for instance, in NDVC, now you will see that, you know, they, they provide last 24 hour data, last five day data, and last basically 45 days of, you know, data. So, there's a very, very, you know, kind of basically real data. Understand that none of this data have been QCD yet completely. And, and there's warning basically by, you know, NDVC, you know, and uh, you can use this, but uh, at your own risk. They recommend that basically you use, you know, the historical data that has been QCD. You uh, come in anytime, you know, you want to make a comment, please. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to access the data. As soon as I click this, at the bottom right here, you saw it says that you're at NDVC V41002. And now you need to select, you know, basically your start and end time. Automatically, we default, you know, to the latest data that's available there, okay? But I'm going to select data that has been QC'd. Let's go to, let's say, 2012, okay? And I'm going to uh, go to all the way December. I'm going to get entire year data for this station, okay? So I selected December 2012, and I'm going to click December 31st. And you can select the hours, minutes, if you basically wish, you know, certain hours, but I usually set to the end of it and say done. As soon as I click data, default, we assume that, you know, basically this is going to get, you know, about a month-long data. Uh, there's a basic reason for that. Some, some basic organization will you know, allow you only to fetch, you know, one month data at a time, okay? So that's the logic, you know, when during the development proof of concept, you know, went through, you know, that's why we established this kind of, you know, automated, you know, basic procedures and so on. But you can come here and overwrite that, okay? And and basically, you know, we will go back and handshake with the organization and then get the data, that entire year data that, you know, you need, okay? So, in this case, I'm going to go from January 1st all the way to December 1st, 2012. So, start time, end time. All you have to do is not just retrieve the data. And be patient. Okay? Sometimes, sometimes the data is packed 
in huge files. Uh, they are either tar files, gzip files, you know, binary files, all sorts of things. And so, as soon as the data is fetched, this, you know, scroll basically up, but you need to scroll down so that you can see, you know, the entire year data for NDBC 41002. Data here, we limited ourselves to waves and winds, okay? There are other data out there. That's why basically, uh, at least, you know, districts that, you know, we work with, you know, this is the most common, you know, data sources, you know, that generally, you know, request it, and that's why we basically limit things to this data. If there are interest requests, you know, basically, you can uh, make those requests, you know, to Julie, and then we can populate this as necessary. The waves are in blue, and winds are red. And, and basically scale, white scale is shown right here, and the units, you know, basically are there. At the bottom, you know, there's basically a, a slider, you know, bar, and you can basically, you know, zoom into any particular month or whatever, you know, let's say month of, you know, right, time frame, you know, so that you can see entire data or a section of it and so on. At the bottom of this, what we call the functions, okay? These are the operations that basically we're going to, the data now is fetched, you know, basically, right? It's cached, you know, and we are waiting, you know, basic instructions, you know, from the user. What do you want to do with this data? Now that we went and got it, right? Entire, you know, one year data. Well, you may want to, you know, look at the tabular data, okay? So click the tabular data, and in this case, it created a file, Okay, and bring your cursor on the file, you know, basically, and at the bottom it says, you know, this is a WaveNet underscore NDBC 41002. I don't know whether you can see on the screen or not, but uh, 2012 underscore 2012 1231.csd. Okay, so the the file name is has to be distinct descriptive because multi users come here and if they're gonna to go to the same station, we learn our lesson, and one user comes right over the other, there's a way we don't do that, you know, and that kind of stuff. But we we preserve keep this data and well if I'm doing obviously on my machine, but you can save the data on your local machine just by right mouse clicking, save link at and then go put on your disk anywhere that basically you need to save this data. If you leave it, you know, on my server, then I'm going to run Scrubber basically and get rid of that data because I, I don't have unlimited disk space. Okay? So my suggestion always when you are, you know, working, you know, with this, save the information to your own basically local machine. Okay? So I'm going to click that and just want to show you basically what happens to it. Here we provide three options. Open the file, save file, and sometimes, uh, you know, you might want to apply this procedure, you know, open file, you know, to all of the things. Uh, sometimes I do that, sometimes, you know, it's useful, but, you know, usually I'd like to open and, and QC the data, okay? So in this case, I hardwired and told basic the system, you know, that I'm going to open this, you know, with the Excel file, CSV. You can, you can set your own, basically, uh, software, you know, and we say that on the right-hand side, open with, you know, whatever. That's your decision. At the header to this file, we write this information so that it is permanent for your record. It was generated by WaveNet. It's from NDBC 41002. Number of records in this are 5470, and the dates from 2012-01-01 to 12-12-31. You know, and then they have the information based with the columns, you know, tells you. Uh, the data ID, this column, we use that for, you know, running certain programs, operating, you know, identifying, you know, data type and this or that. That's for us, okay? But, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt anything. You can delete that column if you don't need it. Year, month, day, and hour, okay? All of them basically are here, and that column 
you know, this column is the wave height, peak period, every period, peak wave duration, wind speed, and wind direction. Clearly, 41002 is the direction of wind, okay? Yeah. And, and it has the meteorological information. Not all buoys basically may have in all of this information, okay? The second function that basically we do is plot the data. We were told that, you know, they, you guys need some time in this information rather than bringing that data to Excel and then spending time plotting this or whatever. We generate the plot, you know, basically automatically for your uh, project report, this or whatever. So, again, if, if you click, you know, this at the bottom, you see, you know, the, you know, basically file name, distinct, and you can open with whatever, you know, basically, in my case, you know, I'm opening with the photo viewer. And uh, so, brought the data, plot, you know, and you can save that, you know, basically, right mouse click there, save link as, and, and some of the browser, not this one, for instance, Firefox that I'm using, some of them, you know, will also give an option to save it right here, i.e., for instance, you know, we'll do that, okay? So you have two places, you know, to save this. And again, at the top, you know, basically, there's the source of the data that came from WaveNet, and it was from NDBC41, and the time, and top, you know, basically, panel is the wave height, and x-axis is the time, obviously, and the peak period in the middle and the wave direction, you know, at the bottom. Ready to go to basically your document. For the wind, we separate it and uh, plot it basically that as a separate plot. Same thing. Okay. Next function and analysis basically that we perform to provide you some uh, information that you will need, you know, for project purposes. In that, we're going to generate essentially wave height and roses, you know, and the, well, roses and histograms for wave, wave height, wave period, and, and width. Let's look at the wave height rose. In this particular buoy, this is the wave height rose, okay? And most of you are familiar basically with that, but, you know, it's done on the fly basically. So you don't have to run some code in MATLAB or Excel or some other program program or whatever. In the background, basically, we have code that do this, basically, run and produce you know, this information for you on the fly. We're trying to make life easier, basically, and save time for you guys, you know, for your project. Okay? But again, uh, if you don't like, you know, basically, the way this is done, you want to have it some different form shape, and I can send you probably 10 different things that you know I've done with oil companies that may look differently, and and each person basically does this you know in their own way. So, uh, but this is the way that we have it here. We're open to suggestions. Okay. Uh, if we look at the histogram, these are maybe a little bit different histograms that you're accustomed to seeing. These are two-dimensional basically, wave height, you know you know, and, and direction, and and with the percent occurrence, you know, basically, you know, uh, color-coded based on the percent occurrence, you know, in each of the, you know, basically direction bits, okay? Now, there are different ways to do that. In the uh, proof of concept earlier version of it, we had simple, basically, 1D, you know, uh, histogram, and some people, some users, you know, like those. If you like, you know, basically those to be added, shown to, you know, uh, that can be done as well. But that's yeah, what that's we have. Becky. Yes. Becky, this, this, uh, that plot with the... Uh, histogram? Number of occur yeah, the number of occurrences. Yeah, the histogram. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to look at that. But it, in, here you have the number of occurrences would be useful because if you put it in terms of a percentage it's really teeny percentages but what you can let the user figure that out for themselves just put the total number of occurrences okay on I, that. I have that, that way yeah i have that also but uh i also have a plot that does that you know 
Yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah based on the Those title. kind of smallish. That way, you just put it in, in the title or somewhere in the plot, yeah. somewhere in the white space, total number of occurrences, okay. or, you know, 50,000, then people can easily develop their own shows sure. for what they want. Sure, sure. Uh, and, and I may add, you know, basically, I have another plot that does that, you know, basically. And uh, these two augment each other, you know, but in some application, I like this. And and uh, I think that at the MCR project I did for you, I think this is what we use. But anyway, uh, yeah, this is just the way you can take a note of that. Yeah. And we do the same thing for you for the uh, wave period and uh, wave rows. And histogram again, similar way. And again, all of this can be adjusted. Uh, some people may comment they don't like the color choices or whatever. Again, we're open to suggestions, you know. I, someone was telling me that in government publication you cannot have a black color or yellow color. Well, I didn't know that, but it's good to know, but I can change it. We'll, I'm planning to change it if that's the case, you know. Uh, but we're open to suggestions. And then the last one basically wind rows and uh, wind histogram, similar way. And wind speed basically bends, you know, and shown on the uh, radial, you know, basic contours, you know, and uh, shown right there. Same with the uh, histogram. Okay. All right. So the next 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 function or basic analysis we do is to provide you some statistics. Uh, I call this first order statistics. Most of them basically, you know, and. Uh, but again, we can add, there are a lot of statistics that basically are not here. We can add those, you know, if you like them. First of those is, you know, kind of monthly, you know, basically first order statistics, you know, of the wind and wave per month. You know, you go there and you look at it and what is the count, how many occurrences, right? HS, you know, the maximum, TP, mean period, uh, wave direction and the wind you know, information count and so on and speed and direction. And at the bottom, you know, basically there are total counts. Okay? In in files that we generate in WaveNet and TideNet that are HTM files, right? Those files when you basically want to close, you need to come and click this X associated, you know, with that you know file. Otherwise if you click, you know, basically Act over there, you will be, you know, closing in a wave map, okay? Just be, be aware of that. This is the CSV file because the other one is just a HTM, you know, link. You can screen capture that if you like that, but we also generate the same thing, you know, in an Excel file, CSV file, so that you can copy and put, you know, in your report, you know. 999. Yeah. And 999 basically convention means that no data, okay? Next is the uh, wave percent occurrence table. I think that you guys probably are familiar with this. Uh, my my viewer here, you know, doesn't do a good job. You know, basically this needs to be coming up. You know, it's columnar. You know, this and that kind of thing. But uh, you know, uh, but the data is there. You can bring it basically. You know, into your viewer and take a look at it. You know, these are classical basically. At the top, we say that you know. Which direction bends, you know, this is center the bot, right? 22 and a half degree. We identify the station. We give you the left longitude and the depth. Yeah, see what? And, and the uh, number of cases basically that occur, you know. Uh, you can Better, right? Yeah. Okay, there you go, see? Yeah. So now, you know, you can see basically in a nice, you know, format. So it's character size, you know, basically, and uh, you can change it, you know, and now save it to five, you know, and, and we will deal in that form, okay? Uh, we'll save it. And next one is the scatter plot. And again, scatter plot, you know, basically, this is HS you know, versus, versus TP, and basically the blue dots you know, basically show the range 
supposed to you know basically wave height, right? For this you know uh, direction you know basically bends you know uh, uh, period bends you know that uh, that you know occur. So at six seconds you know the wave height that basically were uh, reported you know range anywhere from let's say about 0.5 to uh, about 2.53 meters or whatever. So it gives you basically a distribution, if you wish, you know, two-dimensional. Again, there is a different way, actually, you know, to do this, but we're open to suggestions. This is just one way. And uh, if, if you prefer, you know, some other methods, you know, just let us know. Next one is the contour plot, so the same thing. So this is HS versus CP, but, you know, with the contour plot and percent occurrences again, you know, and we can normalize this again, you know, and with the total occurrence and replot it, you know, again, contours. You see this a lot, you know, in publication, journal publications and so on, you know, but it's totally up to us, you know, basically what you need. You just need to tell us. Exactly. This plot yeah. can be really useful, but I, and we've played, we've tried to deal with the thinning of the information in the X and Y, and it's really tricky. And if you all discover a, a, a slick way to deal with it, it it's really, it, it'd be good. Cause it's, it, actually, this might be something, I wouldn't say it's a research level, but it, it could be. And it, it's trying to show information where the most occurrent things are happening. That's correct. At the same time, take care of the limits where the rare events are occurring yep. um, also. Because it's the rare events that drive a lot of analysis, but it's the frequent occurrence that also drives another type of analysis. Yep. The extreme analysis versus like versus um, BGFX, where the most sometimes the most occurrent the most common occurrences are driving design. Yep. So anyway, uh, uh, thanks. Yep. Um. You, you can glean from this, you know, basically whether, you know, there is any multi-directionality, multi-peaks, you know, in the spectra and so on, you know, different, you know, basically events coming in and so on, long and short waves, you know. It's a revealing, what I'm saying, you know. But, um, so that's what we do under the statistics. The last analysis that we do uh, is generate basically some input files and, um, these are the ENG, dot ENG files for, you know, CMS wave. And, uh, SD wave used to, you know, uh, use ENG files as well, but I think that now they have changed format, you know, right? And to, you know, binary files or whatever. And, but currently this is supporting basically, uh, ENG files or dot spec files that are going to be they are called bus spec files now starting with SMS 11.2 and later, okay? All you have to do is just change the extension, file extension to .spec. So in this case, basically, the source depth, you know, is about uh, 4,300, you know, meter water depth. And uh, if you have a grid depth, you know, basically, uh, there uh, for your grid that you're going to use, you provide that information right here. Let's say it's at the 50 meter depth. And, uh, if you have an angle, you know, for your grid, you know, let's say 30 degrees or whatever, you know, you can put that. And I'm going to assume zero degrees here. And click the generate. And without you going to SMS, whatever, do this. And we run basically some code and bang, you have the ENG file. So again, if you move your cursor, you know, here, uh, notice that, oops, I don't have the times and so on, you know, here. So I need to update, you know, basically file name, you know, for this. We modify the others, but it's missing right here. So, but anyway, file generated. And so I'm going to click that file. And again, you can save, right mouse click, save those files to your lo local directory. And I'm going to try to open this. But because this is a one year ENG file, it's a big file. And as soon as I say, okay, watch here, right? It's going to say that it's going to take some time, you know, in opening and reading, you know. But it will open up. Uh, now it's, you know, completed, you know, basically. And it's going to pull it basically for you right there. Okay? So standard basic ENG file that, you know, you guys are familiar with at the top, you know, frequency range, right? 
frequency and direction bins and the uh, frequencies, and then followed by basically time step and the uh, wind speed, wind direction, and peak frequency, and water level, and so on. And in this case, you know, basically the, the rest of it is the uh, energy density, right? And by the way, I, I don't know, but I I use this quite a bit, you know, uh, I think that at least in this notepad++, plus plus, I can do control, I believe, F3. It will go and find, you know, basically time steps, you know, basically lines. Sometimes I check those, you know, and sometimes I delete, you know, basic certain things to do the test runs or that way, you know, because the file is used sometimes. Sometimes, you know, you will see that when I'm saying this tool can generate, you know, basically very large, huge files, can download, you know, basically uh, lots of data for you. And it, it's up to you, basically, how much of it you want to retain or keep, save, you know, and delete and so on. Okay. So that's essentially basically what we did, you know, with the, uh, you know, with the, uh, Yeah, so you can, what I'd like you to do basically probably once, you know, we're done, you know, with this, uh, we said that this is about, you know, 45 minutes or so. If you like, I can quickly go through one with station and, but the process is identical. We decided basically the functions that, you know, we're going to basically apply analysis, you know, are coming to all of them. In the previous version, we were doing different things, you know, depending on the data and that kind of thing. But I think that this makes, you know, life easier, simple, you know. Now, you can go here, uh, basically, let, let me show also something else, you know, here. If I display basically with station, then you can go there and look at it and say that what's the, you know, closest, you know, with station that basically I have in this area, if you want to basically grab that, right? That's the closest or nearby you know, station. So you can do that as well. And uh, sometimes I display two or three of them you know, at a time, you know, just to see the population or the information available to me. And the process is no different. As soon as I select the width station, and automatically tells me that the width basically has, for the East Coast, the data up to through, you know, 12, 2012, right? So we collect basically from the width one year data, automatic. So I'm just going to basically uh, retrieve that data. But understand that the width packed, you know, like the 20 year hind cache unit into one big, huge, humongous, you know, basically file. So it may take a little bit of time, but uh, we do have some procedure, hopefully, you know, that uh, speeds up and it's not really bad. At the beginning, we were having some, in the proof of concept, you know, version, you know, some difficulty with but we learn how to get, you know, basically humongous data now. So, same, same thing that we went through with the NDDC. So you do tabular data, and bingo, basically you got the file, and if you click it open, and you're going to get the CSV file in Excel, same as before, nothing different, okay? And all the, basically, analysis tools that I showed, you know, for, you know, NDDC apply to this as well. So with that, I think that it would be good for you to just go and basically cover, well, it's your choice. You can cover all of them, but uh, I, I don't want to really uh, load you up with a lot of information and that kind of thing, but take your time, kind of digest it, you know, go through some cases and NDBC with in your area of interest and, and play with it. Uh, select, you know, NDBC buoys that are not directional, right? This or whatever. In the NDBC, I also want to tell you that basically there will be stations that are, you know, uh, Siemens stations, for instance, right there. So, uh, the Siemens stations, you know, these are MET stations. Most of them are land-based, but they are, they are meteorological, basically. And we probably kept those because in some studies we had we needed to use them. And so I can go get basically the wind information, temperature, this, you know, pressure, and that kind of stuff that basically I need. 
So uh, that's why, you know, basically they are included, what I'm saying, in the NDBC. But if you guys have some suggestions, this or whatever, uh, you know, we, we can add, you know, others as well. But uh, that's basically what I want to cover today, just uh, NDBC and WIS. And again, the purpose is basically for you guys to see this latest version, go play with it, and hopefully that uh, you will not crash, you know, the uh, server. I don't think so, because uh, I think they will support, you know, basically uh, quite a large number of people. My machine is currently residing, and it's available to you only on CoreNet, ACID machine, okay? Uh, we have not decided yet where the final product you know will reside we're looking at the virtual servers we're looking at the cloud systems and probably pull this out so that anyone basically within the government because i have people from the navy marine corps everyone basically is very interested in this uh, i purposely didn't put anything you know as i said you know uh related to military classified stuff but i have some other places you know and uh but, you know, they are very interested because many of the basically activities, operations are called for, for instance, you know, basically using this. And uh, uh, so it, it can be expanded, what I'm saying, to include other things. But uh, if you guys are familiar with or know some other data sources, you know, bring to our attention and, and make a recommendation. That, and then Julie can decide, you know, how best to go about it. With that, I'm done okay. for today. And then tomorrow, I will go through CDIP probably in GLS and GLCF maybe. And then I will cover probably Wave Watch 3, you know, uh, depending on the time, questions and so on. Uh, last, because some of them are unique, like, you know, Wave Watch 3. Uh, I want to introduce you to this, you know, this is uh, becoming a very... Uh, useful, you know, uh, data source being used, you know, core wide and, and government wide, and uh, so that we can spend some time, you know, it's different. It's not a, you know, point source, you know, in the sense we don't have station, but we're taking some grid data, you know, and the procedure is the same, you know, basically, you're going to basically select a grid location or whatever, and then the rest of it, you know, apply the same concept. Uh, I have to give all the credit for this product. To, uh, programmers, basically, Derek Wilson, who left, you know, basically now works, you know, for the uh, state of New York. Any person that does this type of, you know, thing, GIS and, and web-based type of technology is very popular. Uh, two students I brought here, basically, and stay here one year at ICL and leave, basically, go to Silicon Valley for $300,000 salary. I cannot see people, you know, basically here. But all credit goes to them, really, doing the light work, you know, and the uh, proof of concept stuff. And then Jay Rosati basically took over, and he did a fantastic job, you know. And uh, so Jay is still helping us, and we're hoping that, you know, basically management will hire some young kid programmers, you know, basically can sustain and, and develop further, improve this, you know, basically tool technology. I think that you will see that. This will be very, very useful to you guys, but we're open to uh, suggestions. All right. See you tomorrow. Thank you.